Welcome to the referendum debate. Four days to go and the polls neck and neck. Scotland faces its biggest ever decision. And tonight, we're in Stirling. Campaigners from each side of the debate, Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary and a key figure in the Better Together campaign, Douglas Alexander, Stuart Hosey, the SNP's Treasury spokesman at Westminster, the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, Ruth Davidson, and the actor and Yes campaigner, Elaine C. Smith. Our audience tonight are evenly divided between supporters of independence on one side and opponents on the other, plus some who are still at this stage making up their minds. Our audience here have submitted their questions and our panel have not seen them. Welcome to Wallace High School. To truly command Scotland, you needed sterling. It was the gateway between the Highlands and the Lowlands, the brooch that clasped the country together. Scotland's great warrior heroes, William Wallace and Robert the Bruce, won famous victories here at Stirling Bridge and on the Bannock Burn. And the man who united the monarchies of Scotland and England, James VI, was crowned here. Modern Stirling is balanced between nationalism and unionism. There is an SNP MSP, but a Labour Conservative coalition runs the council. This thriving university city has a strong retail and finance sector, and tourists still flock here to listen to Scotland's story. In four days' time, more than four million voters will write the next chapter. So let's get on with our debate. And our first question this evening is from Thomas Burns. Why would multinational billion pound corporations issue public warnings if they did not mean it? Stuart Hosey. Well, there have been a number of uh, things said by a number of businesses over the last few weeks. Uh, I'm not surprised they've come out. We know that the supermarkets, for example, were called into 10 Downing Street to have their uh, arms twisted up their backs. We've seen that before. We know that the banks have said a number of things, but if you look at that in particular, particularly RBS, they have said no jobs are at risk, no functions are at risk, operations won't change, the way banking is carried out won't change. I think if we listen to other people, Sir Angus Grossot saying much of what's been said is incredibly overstated. There are lots of warnings that are going to be issued, but of course those businesses warn about all sorts of other things. Some of them have an EU in-out referendum on the risk register. Others are even concerned about modest extra devolution. So of course they will consider all of the things that are going to come up next. They will put in place the contingency plans they need to take. That is absolutely normal but no jobs are to be lost, no functions are to be lost, and I think we need to stay very calm and understand in this wealthy, prosperous nation, if businesses think they can make a profit, they will continue to run and operate in and out of Scotland to the benefit of themselves and the economy. We want to take as many questions as possible from the audience, so please put your hands up and I'll come to you in a minute, but first let's go to Douglas Alexander. What actually happened last week was an avalanche of facts engulfed the assertions that we've had from the Nationalists in the last few weeks. You have to ask why every single Scottish bank said that they, they would uh, move their registered headquarters to England in the event of a yes vote. It's because 90% of the products of many of those banks are sold to English customers. So they want to be part of a UK regulatory system they want the authority of the Bank of England, a central bank behind them, and they want the security of 63 million taxpayers standing behind them. So it's not some great conspiracy involving MI5, the BBC, Iceland, <laughs> ASDA, and a whole range of other organisations. The fact is these organisations are not lying. They've got a responsibility. I think they did probably come out last week because of the poll we saw at the weekend suggesting that, yes, support was at 51%, and they felt an obligation to give voice and to speak up. 
Personally, I believe there is a better way that we can secure the 200,000 jobs that are in financial services here in Scotland, and that's to have the faster, safer, better change that is being offered within the United Kingdom so that we can hold on to the currency, we can hold on to the regulator, we can hold on to the stability that's the platform for those Scottish jobs. Thank you. Man of the in the front row. Thanks. Um, Douglas Alexander mentions a whole sea of facts, and I would love to see just one. And maybe I could put it to you that I would ask you just one. You know, I know lots of companies who relocate their head office, and there are zero job losses. So can I ask you to tell me, of the three major Scottish banks, how many jobs will be lost, and what will the impact be to the economy? Well, you don't need to take my word for it. If you look at what Nicola Sturgeon, the Deputy First Minister, has said in the past, retention of corporate headquarters is fundamental to the Scottish economy. I used to be a lawyer in Edinburgh. Once you lose headquarters capability, then it's not just the jobs within those organisations, it's the lawyers, it's the accountants, it's the support services. We've got an interest in keeping every possible corporate headquarter that we can. And when we're in a position that we are now, with just four days to go, the Scottish Government is silent. In any other circumstances, they would be saying this is effectively the end of Scottish banking. OK, let's take a point from the man in the... Mr. Housie, um, the uh, chief economist of Deutsche Bank clearly doesn't have a dog in this fight, yet he has uh, seen fit to make some comments. I wonder what, uh, uh, what do you think, um, whether he's, a, 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 he's missing something or whether he's an idiot. OK, I, I want to bring in the other panel, so we'll come back to that in a minute, but we'll go to the women on this side first with the yes badge. Um, Douglas, is it not also true that um, in the event of the EU and out referendum that American companies are going to move out of uh, Britain to Ireland. OK, let's point, put that to Ruth Davidson. Sure. Well, first of all, I want to pick up on something that, that Stuart said when he was saying that there was no jobs at, at risk here at all. I don't accept that, and neither does the head of Standard Life, who said that he would be moving some of his operations south of the border. There's 5,000 people employed in Edinburgh uh, with Standard Life. I want to know why those jobs aren't worthwhile of, of, of uh, Stuart's concerns. And I think one of the things that, that this conspiracy has about people speaking out, on Monday, billions of pounds were wiped off Scottish registered companies on the stock market. An hour after RBS, an hour after RBS said on Tuesday that it was going to shift its registered headquarters south, it had made £490 million of that back. Now, the Prime Minister, all of the people on our side have been perfectly clear about this. We want as many voices to be heard in this debate. The only people that want to stop voices talking about what's happening seems to be on the other side. People like Jim Siller say there's going to be a day of reckoning for Scottish businesses. People like Jim Siller... <laughs> BP is going to have to bend the knee. That John Lewis, there's talk of a boycott. Um, what is it? What kind of people do these companies think they are? We, they will find out. I don't think it's good for Scottish business. I don't think it's good for people looking at Scotland, wanting to see Scotland open for business, to see a whole list of companies say they're moving their headquarters down south. I don't think that's good for Scottish business. I don't believe Stuart really thinks that's good for Scottish business either. Elaine C. Smith, yeah. is there. <laughs> Is there a day of reckoning on the way if there's a yes vote for businesses in Scotland? Um, I, I don't really think so, but um, on, on the point that was made, I, I don't think there's actually anything wrong with businesses having concerns about what is about to happen. I think I run a small business as well, a small production company. It's, you're perfectly legitimate in asking that. For me in all of this, it's been the way it's been spun. It is the way that it has been dealt with and that, that it isn't... <laughs> We're always, we're always being told about balance. There are thousands of business, small businesses, medium and large, in Scotland who, who also do not have that, that fear, that absolute terror of what is going to happen, and they are not being given the same voice. This is all about lender of last resort, and this could all be sorted, and no run in the pound would have happened if George Osborne had simply said, there will be a currency union, this would be over. <laughs> SNP are being very naive in thinking that there will not be a loss of jobs because, as has been discussed, when the headquarters move south, the functions will go south as well. And when it comes to spin, it's the yes side who have been spinning far more than the no side ever has. And they do not like it when they have to take their own medicine. Stuart Hosey. Um, there's been a number of points. In terms of the Deutsche Bank question, which is actually very important, 
uh, the report seems to take no cognizance whatsoever to the underlying strength of the Scottish economy. We're tax per head for the last 33 years, a relatively stronger fiscal position over the same period. Secondly, in terms of standard life, the same warnings in 1979, the same warnings in 1997, the same warnings in 2014. In terms of what's happened with the markets, the markets haven't been spooked because of Scottish independence. They've been spooked by the lack of preparedness of the British government for Scottish independence. <laughs> and the, the, final, the final point in terms of what Jim Sillo said, there won't be a day of reckoning. There'll be a day of celebration. A yes vote will be a vote of national self-confidence well. for the Scottish people. That's <laughs> But it's not Jim Sillers. Only last week we had the First Minister saying he was Team Scotland, as if somehow David Soule, who left, left the Scottish rugby team out into Murrayfield, as if Lindsay Sharp, who won a gold medal for Scotland, as if Bertie Old, who pulled on the dark blue vest of Scotland, somehow they're not part of Team Scotland. You can't have... You cannot, you cannot offer a day of celebration to your supporters, a day of reckoning to the rest of us, and claim to be uniting Scotland. That is will not the kind of debate we want. Will you, will you join Team Scotland, Douglas? After a yes vote, Douglas, will you join Team Scotland be part I of the team? I don't need to prove my patriotism will to you. you and will you join Team Scotland and be part of the team? Thank you. Thank you. Elaine C. Smith. I just... I I, I, just, I just want to say, and, uh, Jim Sillers actually is a, a dear friend of mine, and I am actually on this whole journey to, uh, in a belief in independence for Scotland because of him and Margot MacDonald. He is a very, very astute politician. At 76 years of age, he has been out there every single day since the death of his wife, campaigning up and down this country. And Jim maybe used language that is it's a slightly old-fashioned, Labourite sort of thing. But what does it mean? Want. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But, but within that, he was expressing much of the sentiments that were on the doorsteps when I was out in Pilton and Craig Miller yesterday. Not many people in Craig Miller are shopmen, John Lewis, or waiters, or any of those shops. <laughs> and they are, and, and they, were, they were concerned. A lot of citizens are concerned at that sort of threatening coming from businesses, almost saying to them, if you don't vote the way we want to, we will... It's, and it is your democratic right. If you don't think that somebody is treating you right, you take your business elsewhere. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Right, let's take a point from the man on the edge here, yes. I think I'd like to raise four points relative well, to no, this. Well, no, 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 one. No, sorry. <laughs> no, really, we don't have time for first, four. One, please, first, quickly. the share price did drop and it reappeared the next, or bounced up the next couple of days. That could have been avoided if the Chancellor had come out and defended it. But the real reason that happened was because somebody in the Treasury leaked that. <laughs> now, in addition to that, well, let's that the, let's the headquarters, that okay, the moving and headquarters, of the Royal Bank and Lloyds Bank to London, under European law, they have to have their head offices in the, the, the countries in which they have the greatest turnover. You should remember, and you should know this, Douglas, that Lloyds have had their headquarters in London for many, many yeah. years. Yeah. But who is... Thank you. Who thank is... You. Thank you. I'll who come is, back to this David, Who is the major shareholder in the Royal Bank of Scotland? And how dare they come out and say that unless they had had the shareholders, in other words, the Treasury, con condone them actually coming Let's out have and an answer. That. Let's have an answer. First Ruth all, Davidson. As I understand it, the Treasury were responding directly to media requests, and they were responding to them with the best of the knowledge that they had. The Sun newspaper had already... Well, the just, for the record, already just for the record, it. just for the record, I received that email and I didn't request it. Well... <laughs> That they had a media request from the Sun that had already spoken to somebody at RBS uh, and they were responding to that while the markets were closed, as I understand it. Now, what I want to, to, to know from what Elaine was saying was, you know, I, I have the huge amount of respect for Jim Sillers. I really do. And actually, I have a more respect for him in some ways than some of the positions that the SNP have taken, because the independence he wants is actual independence. He wants his own currency. He wants to have a different head of state and all of that. But, but let's not write off 
what he said. He didn't say it because he was caught out by journalists. He crafted a press release and sent to it, it yes. to the whole of the country. And, and I actually don't think that the undertones of that were terribly helpful to anybody in this. Day of reckoning, learn to bend the knee, talking of boycotts. You know, this doesn't help us when we come back together because no matter what happens, on the 18th. We have to come back together as a country. And I think when I look at Alex Salmond and he's organising his day of celebration, he says he's got his negotiating team in place. I look at the semi-final team of uh, a football team in the semi-finals. It's already booked the own top bus for having won the final. And we know how that goes. I'm a Dunfermline fan. That doesn't work out. And I don't <laughs> think that he should be taking the people of Scotland for granted when the votes haven't been cast yet. For so the next three and a half days, I'm out there fighting. Talking about conspiracies, I'm out there fighting for Scotland. Thank you very much. Let's take another question. But before we do, just to remind you that uh, we can, you can contribute to tonight's debate on Twitter. The hashtag is BBCNDREF. You can text us on 80295 and you can also email us at referendumdebate at bbc.co.uk and you can go to the BBC Scotland News website to see a selection of your comments. Another question now from Alan Caldwell. Better together were sincere about more powers, why was it only offered uh, one week before? If Better Together were sincere about offering more powers, why were they only offered with a week to go? Ruth Davidson. Well, one, they weren't. We set up our Strathclyde Commission almost two years ago. Uh, we returned that much earlier this year. It's been sitting on the Scottish Conservative Party website. Our plans for more powers available for anyone to see, www.scottishconservatives.com, for a number of months. We are utterly convinced that, as a Conservative and somebody from the right of centre, I want to end the situation in Scotland where a First Minister and a Finance Minister, at the start of every year, get a block grant and all they're in charge of doing is handing that out, and they never have to look a taxpayer in the eye. I want a First Minister and a Finance Minister in Scotland to look at taxpayers and be in charge of the taxes that they raise. So it's not about what we've had for seven years. Well, that's what you get with a noble. And what, it, what it's not about is, it's not about saying that everything that's good in Scotland is because the Scottish Government spent money on it, and everything that's bad in Scotland is because of these guys down at Westminster. And that's all we've had for seven years. That doesn't make our country better. Thank we can you. have a better country Thank you. without losing the things that we like about this part of the United Kingdom. OK, a point from the man in the purple uh, shirt in the, right in the middle of the audience, yes. Is it not true that because this is a constitutional change that you're offering us more powers, that, that has to go through the House of Commons, and they can then veto any, any powers that you give Scotland? OK, thank you. We'll go to the right way up the back. Uh, yes, with the glasses. Yes, thank you. Well, all three main Scottish parties, um, unionist parties, said ages ago that there will definitely, they're all agreed, there will definitely be more powers uh, for the Scottish Parliament in the event of a, of a no vote. But isn't it just shocking that four days from the referendum, well, there is still so much uncertainty because, yes, Scotland haven't given any answers and nobody knows what's going to happen in the event of a yes vote, even down to when we would actually become separate because they have just dictated in their white paper the date that um, Scotland would become an independent country. It couldn't become independent until the negotiations are finished, however long that takes, and I think it's going to take longer Stuart, than what they get. Thank you. Um, Stuart Holmesy, you can't possibly know a date, a potential date for Scottish independence, even if there is a yes vote, can you? Well, we have, because it's laid out in the but, white but paper. How, but how do you know? how long the negotiations will take? Well, what we've said is that some of the negotiations on the key things need to be complete. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, the negotiations on other things certainly need to be started. Uh, but the process begins with a yes vote next Thursday. It ends in the spring of 2016 when we become independent. And the outstanding negotiations on other matters will continue after that. But in terms of this question about more powers and devolution, we've got proposals from Labour, the Conservatives and the Lib Dems which would devolve something in the order of 20 to 30 per cent of Scotland's tax base to Scotland. I think the days when unionist politicians can say you are grown up enough to have 20 or 30 per cent of your resources is, is are it not over. 40? Is it not near 40 per cent for the Conservative? Well, Ruth Davidson 40. says it's 50 per cent for her it's, it's 50 per cent of, of, the, of the spending of the Parliament. It's barely 30 per cent of the total tax base. The Scottish people are grown up enough, mature enough and democratic enough to look after 100 per cent of our taxes. Very, very colourful shirt, yes. I'm prepared for the, uh, the, good, the yes vote. <laughs> it's going to be sunny every day. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Go on. <laughs> I would just like to take up uh, Ruth Davidson. 
on um, her stance on all this devolution that's going to happen. You, came, you became head of the Conservatives because you said you were going to draw a line on any further devolution going to Holyrood, and that's a fact. Yeah, and Alex Salmon said that Sterling was a millstone round her neck, now he's fighting for a currency union. <laughs> there, is, there, is, there is clearly an appetite. There is clearly an appetite in Scotland for more powers, but remaining part of the United Kingdom, having the strength, stability, keeping our armed forces, keeping the things that we like about the UK, but having more autonomy and having a, a way in which we do politics in Scotland where it's not a politics of grudge and grievance, did which you, is what we've had for seven years. You want and that's what in, I want sir? to that's what I want, want to, to reflect. In. I would just like to say that um, I, I think that uh, she's done a complete 180 degree turn on this. OK, thank you. Um, I've been in Scottish Labour for almost 30 years and every one of those days I've believed in devolution. I've stood in George Square in 1992 demanding a Scottish Parliament. I've carried torchlit uh, banners in uh, Calton Hill. I've stood in the rain in the meadows arguing for a Scottish Parliament. But when the late, great Donald Dewar uh, said that devolution was a journey, I think he spoke the truth. And it's a journey to a different destination from separation from the rest of the United Kingdom. So I'm proud of the fact that we legislated back in 1997 to establish a Scottish Parliament. I'm proud of the fact that since then, we've had 27 further devolutions of powers within the United Kingdom to that Scottish Parliament. And so when we published our proposals back in March, Powers for a Purpose, it was setting out Scottish Labour's thinking about how do we get a stronger Scottish Parliament with the strength, stability and security of the United Kingdom behind us. Why now did I you honestly... water it down? Why did you water it down from your original proposal? It was, it was watered we didn't. down in terms of It was a of democratic tax. process and came up with the proposals that we put before the Scottish Party, which was accepted which unanimously. Were, which James. were weaker than the original proposals. Well, there were interim proposals which we looked at and we've said... <laughs> And we've said, let me answer your point, we've said that we believe, and this is a serious point, I know there are some people in this debate who believe that nothing good can ever come from the rest of the United Kingdom. We believe to strike the right, well that's significant and I accept that, I just disagree. There are significant benefits to pooling and sharing the risks, resources and rewards of the United Kingdom across and between 64 million people. That means, for example, we can have a state pension system with 64 million people standing behind it. We can have a national insurance scheme. Let's come back to the question. So I'm sorry, why, but so more, that's why. How powers. do you strike the right balance yeah. between a strong Scottish Parliament and retain the strength, stability and security of the United Kingdom? Now, the fact is, I believe that the proposals that have been put forward and the timetable for change actually will give Scotland what most of us want, which is faster, better and safer change within the United Kingdom, not all of the risks, uncertainties and doubts that we still haven't had answered with four days to go before separation. Thank you. I'll take a point from the woman in the white top on the end. Yeah. The, woman in the, the woman in white with the spots, the spotted dress. Yes. Hi. Um, I think we've got the best of both worlds right now. I'm very passionate. I believe in that. And that's why I'm here. Yeah, my question is, don't you think that, given that Alex Salmon now says we can keep the pound, don't you think we would have more powers in a non-independent Scotland than actually in an independent Scotland with fiscal union? Well, uh, I, I don't actually uh, understand why you would give up the chance of all of the power to take just some of the power. I really don't understand that. But also... I would like to say, like Douglas, we were in the same demonstrations. And, you know, a great admirer of Donald Dewar, I was there involved in a constitutional convention that brought about the Scottish Parliament. And, and those, are, those are things that I treasure. It is a journey. And I think at this point, we are at a really, really important part of the journey where Scots have got to the point, they now, the, the campaigns that have gone on, on both sides here, actually have been wonderful to be part of during these this two years. Although there have been negative parts of it as well, I think it is but, but, wonderful. But we're, on, we're on more powers. No, no, I, I just I, wonder if the, the, I think the, the no. woman would like to come back to you. What would you like to say? Yeah, the reason that I don't feel we need more powers is that I have an MP at Westminster. I'm British. I'm already represented at Westminster. <laughs> and, and, your, and your, point, your, point be, your point would be that an and your point would be that an independent Scotland with a currency union 
would have less power. Is that the point you're trying to make? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, Aline C. Smith, that, that is the point that, she, that, that the woman originally made, isn't it? That would there not be less power for Scotland within that scenario? Well, I don't believe so. I think if we have absolute control of of all the fiscal levers, so that we can actually spend. I realise there is a debate within this about a, a lender of last resort. If the Bank of England or the Bank of UK, as it should be called, was actually uh, the the person, the, the bank that was overseeing everything. For me, a little bit of that sovereignty that we would have to, as Matt Carney, uh, uh, Mr Carney has actually said, would be, would be given over. I, I don't mind that because I actually think the overall control and the ability to control and, and look after our own country for the people who live and work here is infinitely preferable to what we have at the moment <laughs> and to some little power. <laughs> The, the, lady, the lady who asked the question is absolutely right. The currency union, as proposed, and we know why it's been proposed, they worry that they would lose the referendum if they weren't able to pretend they can keep the pound. If we have a currency union, we will, we will end up as Scots with less power, not more power. It means that a government in London to whom we would send no representatives would set our interest rates, which affect our rents, which affect car loans, which affect credit card bills. It means they would set the parameters for fiscal policy, as Elaine says. Why would we want less power rather than more power when we can actually have Scottish representation in a UK parliament and all of the strength and stability that being part of that single market brings? Thank you. I'll come to you in just a second. Um, yes, the man in the, in the orange uh, jacket. Yes, sir. Douglas, you are the strategy chief of Better Together. Now, the three parties came up with their devolved powers back in April, some four or five months ago. And uh, after the knee-jerk reaction to the, the increase in the polls, Gordon Brown, who's not part of Better Together, then puts a back of a five-packet timetable claiming that these powers can be signed, sealed and delivered within four months. Now, if I was in charge of that strategy, wouldn't it be a good idea to have those powers signed, sealed and delivered in time for the referendum? Then you might have won. But the way things are, Douglas, okay, the way things are, it Douglas, yeah. it seems that, to quote your Better Together TV advert, you haven't really thought things through. Just, just <laughs> First of all, if people are making their judgment as to the back of a fag packet, I don't know if you've had the chance to read the yes side's proposals on the currency, but they are deeply, <laughs> deeply troubling. We, we know what the capital's going to be, we know what the flag's going to be, but we don't know what the currency's going to be. Alex Hammond has got himself into a position, let me answer the question, has got himself into a position where he's saying the sovereign will of the Scottish people, which will be expressed on Thursday, can bind the people of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. That's not the way it works. It would mean that those parts of the United Kingdom who are presently part of the United Kingdom would become a foreign government. And they are perfectly entitled to make their judgment as to whether a currency union is in their interest right, as you. surely as we are thank in Scotland. You. Thank you. Man in the yellow. Yeah, um, Douglas mentioned there um, a minute ago about um, the monetary policy and fiscal policy effectively becoming the prerogative of the Bank of England and we have no control over it. Um, I don't see how that advances our cause as a nation, particularly given the, the tendency on the Yes Scotland uh, campaign to basically talk down and poison the relationship with the rest of the UK. And I'm wondering how many companies have to give warnings of price rises or possible redundancies. And I know two people at RBS who have been told that their job is at risk okay. as a result of what's going on. OK, thank you. And we'll come to the man here with the glasses. Sorry, behind you, sir, behind you. Yeah. We were told by, by Alistair Darling and by Alex Salmon that this would be a non-political debate. Now, I know of nothing more given more express opinions than this referendum. Surely we should have it as a non-political debate, because none of us here will be involved because by the time of the uh, referendum is taken, by the time a devolution comes in or <coughs> independence comes in, we will all be, we'll all be at six feet under. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, let's take the next question, actually. Let's take the next question now at this point from Paul Garner. Paul Garner. Hi. Do the panel feel that the media coverage during the run-up to this referendum has been fair and impartial? Has media coverage <laughs> been fair and impartial? Elaine C. Smith. 
<laughs> Aline Seasmith. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I have been really, really disappointed, I have to say. Uh, the fact that we are actually neck and neck in the polls is now on a miracle, I think, at the moment, given, <laughs> given, that, given that only one Sunday newspaper in Scotland, the Sunday Herald, has come out in favour of independence, and even then, only a couple of months ago. I think the barrage of negativity, the barrage of, of things that are, are, are biased, that have, have emerged through, through the London-based papers has really shamed us all, I have to say. And, uh, and uh, even, even with things like... I, I mean, it's actually on a journalistic level as well. Where is the examination? Where, where when, when the exactly. polls were out, like, where was the real examination on, on the BBC and beyond? To, to what was has really been going on here. And I think I think many, many people across this country have been really sickened by it and, and not seen that this has been allowed to be a fair and balanced debate. And this is journalists have been okay. saying this to me as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Ruth Davidson, there's a... Uh, there's a... Uh, a big demonstration outside the BBC in Glasgow today, uh, uh, alleging that the BBC is, has been biased in this referendum. We've heard the similar accusations against the newspapers. What's your response? Well, first of all, there's about, looked like on Twitter, about 2,000 people uh, barricading 6, the BBC. 000. Is it 6,000? Well, that's 6,000 people that are not knocking doors. And I'm glad that BT activists right now <laughs> are knocking doors and are speaking to people across Scotland. Um, as a former journalist myself, I know that under broadcast rules, there's a, there's a rule uh, in broadcasting that when you come up to a, a referendum, both sides have to be given parity of time to make their case, and, th and that's what's happening with the broadcasters. Newspapers don't have that. They can take an editorial decision, and I don't like the kind of dog-whistle nationalism that Elaine just used, talking about London-based papers. Because, uh, Scotland on Sunday... Scotland on Sunday that's come out for no is not a London-based paper. The Scotsman that's come out for no is not a London-based paper. The Sunday Post, the Sunday Post that's come out for no just today is not a London-based paper. And actually, if you want to put it, I know it's over the border, but actually The Guardian, who came out for a no, is not a London-based paper either. It's been headquartered in Manchester, I think, for it years and years and years. But, but nonetheless, I take, you know, take your point. But there, every single one of them has written an editorial saying why. And every single one of them to a man or woman that wrote that editorial has pretty much said the case has not been made, the questions haven't been answered, people do not have enough information to take that leap in the dark. And that's what we're going to do. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Thank you. Uh, the, the man, yeah, the man um, just there with that jacket. Yes, sir. Thanks, James. Uh, Elaine, I have to say respectfully, I disagree with you because what Yes Scotland and the separatists don't understand is that people, people, and, and aspects of the media, um, from wherever they come from, are pointing out the sheer economic illiteracy of your plans for an independent Scotland. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Ruth, you say about questions not being answered. As an undecided voter, you're not answering any questions for me right now. OK, thank you. And the woman um, just behind you with the, the glasses and the, the purple. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if Ruth ever looks onto Facebook and you can actually see the full interviews of the likes of with John Lewis instead of just the BBC editing when he didn't actually say what you're saying. He said, I really think you should look a wee bit further than your nose. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart, I would like to come to Stuart briefly. I'll come back to you, but we've, we've not heard from, from, from Stuart Hosey yet. The question was, do you feel that media coverage has been fair and impartial? Do you? I think when you look at uh, programmes like this, this is the second one I've done, Balanced audience, balanced panel, impartial chair, absolute impeccable balance. <laughs> However, <laughs> we then get the metropolitan sneering of certain journalists Who? and the Nick Robinsons of this world, <laughs> which is causing untold anger in the real world. The, the, there, are, there are people who I know are voting yes, senior people who've not declared who are now likely to declare publicly because of their absolute outrage at the way in which certain parts of the media have chosen to portray this debate. This has energised Scottish politics, 
energised communities, the length and breadth of the people. We're going to have an 80% plus turnout. 97% of the people are registered. And yet... <laughs> and yet that has been... It has been sneered at, it has been talked down, and it's been misrepresented just like that. What's, what's really going on here? I mean, what we've seen is yet another example of dog whistle nationalism. You know, we're in a position where... On Wednesday, we had every Scottish bank announcing that they would move their registered office. And let me at least... Let, let's hear his answer. Do let, the courtesy of listening to the point. In, in the morning... Ladies and gentlemen, hang on, hang on. Hang on a second. Hang on a second, Douglas. The, hang on just a second. I, I, shouting is all very well. Chipping in is all very well. But I'd quite like to hear people's answers as well. Douglas Alexander. In the morning, the First Minister attacked the BBC five times on Good Morning Scotland. He then attacked Nick Robinson live at the press conference that the Scottish National Party were holding. Why has he done that? Maybe that's He's, because the BBC's coverage hasn't been very good. Just let me finish the... <laughs> I think politicians complaining about the media are a bit like fish complaining about the sea. But why has he done this? Because he's a clever man, the First Minister. He's done it for two reasons. First of all, he wants to fool people, and we heard it again this evening, to somehow suggest that we are too put upon by people outside of Scotland to be able to reach our own independent judgments, which is incidentally what the Sunday Post, the Scotsman and Scotland on Sunday have done. I will fight from now until Thursday at 10 o'clock to defy a First Minister who suggests that only he understands what's good for Scotland, when this is a conversation <laughs> within Scotland. OK, let's, let's go to the woman with the red scarf. Yes. Yes, madam, it, yes. Yeah, I think it's shameful for Labour Party to collude with not only the media, and the, but big money as well. Because, in fact, if you look at the social media, you will see a YouTube video showing the clip that was shown by Nick Robertson on the BBC and the, actually what happened in reality, that Alex Salmon answered in length the question he was asked about the currency. Yeah. I think it's shameful that you don't even well, well, represent yeah, the people of Scotland. Okay. Well, Douglas Alexander, very quick, and then we'll come to an empty smoke. The nationalists are struggling with the facts, and so they're trying to change the subject. Okay? Point one. Secondly, let's have no doubt they are laying down the foundation of a betrayal myth. They want, after they lose on Thursday, to be able to say it was London-based newspapers, it was the BBC. We are smarter than that as Scots. We're reaching our own decisions, and nobody, including the First Minister, is going to intimidate us away from making our independent yep. choice Thank on you. Thursday. Uh, Yes, the man in the tie. If they had been handing out gold medals at the London Olympics for sneering, then Alex Salmond, <laughs> Stuart Hosey, and the rest of Team Scotland would have got the gold for sure. Elaine C. Smith first. I, I just I, I think all of us here should at least have some respect for the genuine grievances that are out there about the way the media have behaved. This isn't, I may, because I'm in the media or I'm in the campaign, yes, the, the, you know, you may have a certain opinion about it, but this is a genuine movement out there that says, and could I just say, when we're talking about nationalism, why is it all right to, for, for the whole of the media to be purporting British nationalism? Why is British nationalism good and Scottish nationalism is okay, bad? We'll come to the Yes. Yes. I'm an undecided voter and um, with all the negativity in the last week or so and particularly from south of the border I just wonder what will happen if there's a yes vote and yes wins on Thursday how will the UK government you know will they support or hinder the, the independence right. for Scotland well, we, that may, we, may, we may come into that but we'll stick to the media at the moment if that's okay and take a point from the man here yes so, yes. <clears throat> um, just to point out that the Yes campaign is actually larger than Alex Salmon. There's more than one man. <laughs> and we are, <laughs> we are sick and yeah, tired of hearing these constant attacks on one man. Yeah. We are a movement. Yeah. No, Thank I, you. I, 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 sorry, Vicky. 
Sorry, Boogie, I'm sorry you don't like her, but we are. Let's hear her answer. I absolutely understand that, and I understand how people that have been involved in this campaign who perhaps think something different, like Dennis Canavan, the head of Yes, who wants an independent currency, like Patrick Harvey, the head of the Green Party, who wants an independence currency, feels a little bit hamstrung by being tied to Alex Salmond. But when Alex Salmond goes on television and says that the white paper is the mandate, that is what will happen. When Alex Salmond goes on television and says that what's in that white paper would be the sovereign will, then actually the Yes campaign has to, to take some responsibility that, that that's the prospectus that's being put on the table. And if we are talking about the media, the, the, the woman sit, start sitting next to you with the, the red scarf on who was talking about politicians colluding with the media, well, it was Rupert Murdoch who tweeted that he'd phoned Alex Salmond the night before the poll to have a chat with him about it. So let's not pretend that this is only on one side of this. I mean, I think there's some quite unlikely bedfellows on all sides of this. And, you know, it's not just Alex Salmond, it is Brian Souter and Rupert Murdoch and all the rest of it that's on this okay. side of the, the debate. Next question. Dorothy Christensen. Let's have a question from Dorothy Christensen. I want to live in a more fairer, a more equal society, so should I vote yes or no? Douglas Alexander. You should vote no and let me explain why. I believe the best foundation... <laughs> the best foundation by which we can get that fairer and more equal society is 64 million people working together. I don't want a race to the bottom... I don't want a race to the bottom on taxes, on terms and conditions for working people, on pay. And that's what I fear we will see. There is only one measure in those 670 pages of Alex Hammond's white paper, which is about redistribution. It doesn't redistribute money from the rich to the poor. It actually gives a 3p tax cut to some of the richest corporations in society. If we are serious, if we are serious about delivering a fairer society, I would like to see a banker's bonus tax, money taken from the banks to help fund get our young people back into work. I would like to see an energy price freeze so that the big six energy companies actually are held accountable and we can get gas and electricity bills down. I would like to see a banker's levy so that we can make sure the balance sheets of banks are used properly for the benefit of some of the poorest people in society. The difficulty is every one of those policies is opposed by the Scottish Government. Every one of those policies is supported by the Labour Party. So we will be stronger together and we can deliver an society Holfie. together. Douglas said he wants to see an energy freeze. We've proposed an energy price cut. I think that's a far more sensible thing to do. <laughs> the, uh, the enhanced childcare plan saving families £5,000 per year per child. Uh, tax credits and welfare rising in line with inflation. Uh, keeping and extending the living wage. Keeping the educational maintenance allowance. Building on the support the Scottish Government already gives to those in need with their council tax, uh, helping, helping, yeah. helping 500,000 vulnerable families. You see, we've got to make political choices so we can continue to share the risks of keeping Trident 30 miles from our largest city, or we can abandon Trident and make Scotland a fairer place. Yeah. fairer country, probably one of the key things is our NHS. I'm a consultant surgeon. I've worked in England. I've worked in Scotland. I grew up in India and I've seen countries where they envy our NHS. Mm -hmm. And I know that today, as we speak, five million of us in Scotland have many, many, many patients with diseases that are so rare that we need currently today to seek treatment down in England. 60 different conditions we would not be able to treat in Scotland if we did not collaborate with our colleagues in England. Medicine is becoming much more specialised, more advanced. We need to collaborate together. We will, we will compromise the care of these patients if we do not work more closely. And as okay. it is with devolution, we currently, as we are, we, we have already compromised on standards All right. because we, I try to get money for my patients to, rate, to make sure my nursing colleagues are paid the same as people right. in England. I think we've got the point. Thank you very right. much. Right. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's take it apply. Let's take it apply now. Elaine C. Smith. Well, I, I can't answer the specifics of the NHS not being health minister at all. 
by X. It'd be great if we could hear each other. Let's hear, let's hear this answer, please. Yeah, I, I do believe, however, that with a written constitution in Scotland, we will enshrine the rights of people here to a, a health service that will be free at the point of need and ensure that we have the rights to do that. And to, to have a written constitution, to go back to your point, I believe that voting yes is actually the start of creating a fairer, better society. For the last 50 years of my lifetime, I have not witnessed those powers or that Westminster in particular, through successive governments, have actually done enough for the people who need it the most. Okay. That is why there is what is being referred to as a politics of grievance, if you like, because it's not being done. The people who need it the most, the poorest, the most vulnerable and the sick, have not been looked after by the people they elected to Westminster, oh, and that is why, oh, and that is why the <laughs> First of all, a written constitution has never set a broken leg. We're talking about health here. And what we see is that health policy in Scotland has been devolved for 15 years. And it has been solely in the control of Holyrood politicians to spend money on health. And the SNP promised, they promised that every pound that came up uh, every pound that came from healthcare down south that is a consequential up here would be spent on health and they haven't done it. Just this week the IFS, an independent body, said that the amount of money spent on healthcare down south has gone up by 4.4%. In Scotland it's gone down by 1.2%. They're I'll spending the less, the they're healing less, they're telling less. The women's question is the scarf and the pink. Yes, uh, the blonde hair, scarf, pink top. The woman further back. You've just put your hand down the second. Um, it was exactly the point that Ruth Davidson has just made that okay. um, in that recent IF, um, IFS, IFS report, yeah. report yeah. Okay. that there was um, a reduction in Scotland as opposed to an increase in, in the rest of the UK. Thank you. And you can't deny that. Thank you. And the man in the blue shirt's further down. Yeah. I just want to pick up on um, what Mr Hosey said about bringing down energy bills. Uh, the actual national grid, £18 billion pounds was set aside this year for the whole UK national grid. £6 billion pounds of that has gone to Scotland. Where are you going to find the money? Through increased energy prices. Okay, let's try to stick to the question, which is a uh, question. Contributions on this, please. A fairer, more equal society. The woman with the glasses. Yes, in the middle. Uh, if Westminster had any interest in creating a fairer and more equal society, why didn't they follow the guidelines or other recommendations of the Macron report, set up an oil fund and reinvest some of that money into the deprived areas of Th Scotland? Thank you. Yeah. And the check. Check yes. Registering themselves down south after separation, with big businesses getting a 3 per cent tax cut, who then bears the brunt of picking up the tab of continuing to fund our public services in Scotland? OK, thank you. And uh, the woman in front, yes. Yeah. I, I would like to say that I respect Mr Alexander's passion about getting things equal for Scotland, but I worked in Lanarkshire through the Thatcher years, through the Labour years, and I saw what happened with the children, with the unemployment, and I feel that Westminster can't do it. Douglas yeah, Alexander. Yeah. When, when we were in office in those 13 years, we lifted 100,000 Scottish children out of poverty, we lifted 200,000 pensioners out of poverty, and it didn't happen by chance. It happened by choice to establish a minimum income guarantee, to set up a pension credit, to establish free TV licences, to establish all of the other changes we were able to make, introduction of minimum wage, for example. It is about the conscious political choices that we make, and that's where I disagree with the suggestion Forgive me, let me finish the point. That's where I disagree that somehow we can place all responsibility elsewhere. We have a responsibility. At the moment, we are being offered a prospectus by Yes Scotland that says we can have Scandinavian levels of public services and American levels of taxation. It's just not true. Man of the choices. Yes. The No campaign have been trying to uh, perpetuate this myth that if we stay in the union, then we're going to get the best of both worlds. Do they want to tell that to the thousands upon thousands of people who are getting their meals from food banks? Thank you. Uh, the, woman, the, woman here, yeah, the, 
debate seems to have separated people into those that are proud to be Scottish and those that are also proud to be Scottish and British. Are we really going to separate the British Isles and such a small majority vote? OK, thank you. And uh, the man in the, the red T-shirt. Yeah, three, two or three rows back. Yeah. So, Mr Alexander, your government, 13 years, the Poverty and Social Exclusion Report, there was an unbroken rise from 14% poverty in 1983 to 33% in June this year. You have no record to stand on, sir. Just you caused more poverty. This, this government service, continues to cause poverty. Schools, record cause numbers of children more lifted poverty, out of poverty, sir. Record number of Read the report. Lifted out of poverty. Read the report. Read the report. Okay, I know facts are inconvenient. That's the point of the facts. Read the report. One more point, and then I'll come to Stuart Hosey. Yes, the man in the, the, the dark, dark shirt. Yeah. The council's at the vanguard of helping disadvantaged groups, and yet there's been a council tax freeze for four years. Thank you. Stuart Hosey. The, the NHS is an issue in this referendum, there's no question about it. The resource budgets for the NHS in Scotland are rising every single year. And let's, and let's be absolutely clear, in the NHS in Scotland today, because it's independent, we have a record number of nurses and midwives, a record number of consultants, paramedic and dentist numbers, paramedic and dentist numbers are up. But the real threat to the NHS comes from the privatisation and charging down south, which would okay. reduce the Scottish Let, Bloc grant. I'd like to bring in the let's woman the, who. The, uh, let's bring in this woman. I'll come back to you. The right. woman who works in the NHS. Yes. I work in the NHS. I see that for the same job, specialist nurses in my field are paid, are, are down banded and appallingly paid compared to a nurse anywhere else in the UK who does the same job. We cannot fill posts in the NHS because the jobs are so unattractive. They are not appreciated, they are not paid properly. Why, if you have a postcode lottery to be born in Dundee, should you get less access to nursing, less access to psychologists than if you were born in Hull okay. or anywhere else in the UK? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ruth Davidson, quickly. Quickly, Ruth Davidson, I'll what, come back to you. What Stuart just told this audience is simply not true. The IFS has run the numbers. Spending on health in England has gone up. It has gone up by 4.4%. In Scotland, it has gone down. It has gone down by 1.2%. And to take a bit of the heat and light out of this and get back to the lady in the front who said, do you want a more, how, a more equal society, yes or no? It's no surprise that we would say no and they would say yes. But listen to people who are independent in this. There is a reason why the Guardian newspaper wrote its editorial yesterday to say that if you want a more equal society across the whole of the UK, you have to vote no. There's a reason why the IFS came out earlier this year and said that if you vote yes, there will be £6 billion of extra cuts to Scotland. Stuart Hosey. £6 billion pounds of Stuart extra Hosey. cuts. Okay. That doesn't sound more equal to me. The, let's be clear what the IFS have actually said. They have said if there is a no vote, the Scottish bloc will continue to fall until at least 2019. Now, the lady's question, none of us want to see postcode lotteries in terms of NHS provision. But I'll tell you this, it will come if we follow the model of NHS privatisation in charging in England. And that's not me that's saying that. It's, it's Andy Burnham, Labour Party Shadow Health Secretary, who's been told to keep his mouth shut today by the Labour Party because he's warning against the risks of NHS privatisation. Yep. If, if I'm not finished, Douglas, if privatisation no, 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 no. and charging happens in England, we all know there will be a cut to Scottish funding. And we'll leave OK, on. hang on. That's what's hang on. going to happen. Going hang on, hang on. Douglas, Douglas Alexander, if you could briefly, really briefly, we're running out of time, respond to that. Thank you. Let me try and respond to that. My mother worked in the health service in Scotland for 40 years. I don't think somebody working in the health service is a reason to sigh, incidentally. I think it's a reason to feel pride. <laughs> dare try and suggest that my mother's service is something to be sneered at. Now, if I, if, I, if I for a minute believed that a vote for no was going to deliver the kind of changes that Stuart suggested, I would not be recommending a no vote. The fact is, with the powers that we have in the Scottish Parliament, the capacity to raise taxes 
or to cut them. The fact that we have powers across the piece in terms of funding means that we can guarantee, with a no vote, a publicly funded, free at the point of need, National Health Service in Scotland forever, All or right. as long as we, as Scots, choose. Thank you. That's the fact. Thank you. Next question. Next question, I'll come to you. Sorry, we're just running out of time. Claire Douglas has the next question. Claire Douglas. As a young mother who is scared and unsure of the consequences of my vote for my child and their children, what is the one thing that you can say to me to give me faith in your campaign? Who would you like to ask first? Elaine. Elaine C. Smith. And this has to be brief. We're really, really it tight for time. It has to be brief. Oh, no, I'm never brief. <laughs> um, I, so people are worried. Yes, people are uncertain. They don't I, know what to do. I, to what do you I say totally to understand and appreciate that. I think that uh, I, I am a mother as well. I am a grandmother of a 16-week-old baby. My vote for yes is because I want to see a better place for her. I actually believe that if we have the powers and controls here in Scotland, that we can look all the politicians in the eyes and say to them, this is the type of country we want to live in. Yes, as I said earlier on, is the start. There will be an election in 2016 where every single party will put out their stall. And we will then decide for your child, for my grandchild, for all our children, which party will best represent the needs of the people here and okay. that's what yes it, it really does have to be brief at this stage Douglas Alexander first of all I'm a dad and I want the best for my kids and for all the children here in Scotland all of us want the best yeah. for Scotland I believe that the best way to guarantee the funding for our National Health Service the funding for our schools the funding for child care is a no vote I also believe that we can have the faster better, safer change that I sense most of us in Scotland want to see with a no vote and the start of the process of change starting afterwards. I am genuinely worried as to the risks, the costs and uncertainties of an irreversible vote on Thursday for my children and for children right across Scotland. I'd urge you to vote no. Thank you. I, um, I don't want the risks of UK austerity mm -hmm. for my daughter. I want the certainty... <laughs> I want the certainty of the Scottish people making the right decisions, not just for my child, but for everyone's child within our own nation. Independence is absolutely normal, and I want your child and my child to grow up in a normal, independent country. <laughs> the children of Scotland to grow up thinking that they can go anywhere, they can be anything that they want to do. There is no horizon. <laughs> and I think that we have more opportunities in our country from being part of one of the countries that leads the world. And I'm proud of everything that we've built together. And I'm proud of the university network that we have. I'm proud of the armed forces that we have. I'm proud of the um, consular services that are selling our goods all around this planet. I'm proud of everything that we have built together and I'm proud of the cradle to grave approach that we take so it's not just children but it's when those children become grandparents they can be looked after with their pension too. I'd That's like why I'm voting for That's why I'm voting for I'd like to go back to Claire and ask her what she thinks about what she's heard. Claire. I feel like the no vote for me at the moment Surely what we're living in now is the no vote. Yes. yes. Because if you're truly saying all these promises of things, but why have we not already have all these things? Yes. One of the ten. problems I'm going to stop. One of, one of the problems is that so many of our young people have to leave to find work. And we don't right, want okay. that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's it. The final referendum debate before the big day itself is over. But remember, you can follow all the BBC's referendum coverage this week on television, radio and online. My sincere thanks to our panel here and to the audience. Thank you very much. And indeed to you at home. Thank you for watching all of these programmes from Stirling. Good night.